of love that won't ever change. That won't ever change. All right, here we go. Everybody. Every day, love me your own special way. To the slow drive, yeah, he was the man. <laughs> I used to watch his moves and try to emulate it. Hey, brother, <laughs> are you ready? show live not just sports and entertainment I'm your host Roland Bubba Grimes and once again we are live here at Everlasting Life restaurant in Capitol Heights Maryland where the food is great the service is great and we're here on another Tuesday night shooting live so those of you in the Washington DC metropolitan area make sure you bring in yourselves your children your spouse and even some of the people you don't like over here to Everlasting Life Restaurant on Tuesday nights around 7.30 so you can see these wonderful people that we are engaging with every Tuesday night here on the Rolling Grimes, not just sports entertainment show as we go live. I am excited about tonight's show, like I am about all of them, but it seems that every week we get a little better and better. So this particular week we're doing another educators panel and we have a young lady who is the principal of Heritage Christian Academy here in the Prince George's County area, Atlanta, Maryland. And we also have a young lady who is an educator on the collegiate level and someone also who is doing some community-based education. But I also have a special treat because my first ever candidate running for office, State Senate, Ladies and gentlemen, you'll hear a lot more about him as we go through this evening. Uh, recently, of course, in the news, uh, we've been dealing with the Donnie Sterling issue and a few other things. And I have some commentary on my channel at GrimesNation.com. And you click on the YouTube channel, you can see all of our shows. But I have some commentary that you will find and be quite interesting and somewhat provocative about that and some other things as we go along. But for now, do me a big favor, sit tight. We'll be back at you in a few moments here on Road Grounds, not just, as, just sports and entertainment show live. Right back. restaurant on a Roland Grimes show live, not just sports and entertainment. I just told everyone that uh, when I first started eating at Everlasting Life, I weighed like 700 pounds and now I'm down to 650. Give myself a hand. Yeah. Yeah. And, if, and if you believe that, I have a, a bridge or two in Brooklyn that I want to see. Never mind. Anyway, look, as I promised you a little bit earlier, we have a principal and founder of a local school here in the Prince George's County, Maryland area. But some of the principles and philosophy 
of the school is transformed all over the country. If you would, at this time, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for me as I present the sum and introduce to others the principal and founder of Heritage Christian Academy, Miss Glennis Gill. Thank you, Thank you. I am so happy to have you back. Thank you. We, uh, we actually taped a show with her uh, a few months ago, and then because of my uh, technology skills, I like edited the whole show and deleted it accidentally. <coughs> Excuse me, so I had to call her back. And thank you for showing up, especially you. as you get ready for graduations and proms and all of that. All of that. I just adore you for showing up during this time. Our students this week are in the Grand Bahamas. Our let's, seniors. You know what, let's talk about wow. that. Your seniors, from what I understand, a bunch of them are going to college. Tell me about it. We have 16 seniors. All of them have been accepted into colleges and universities across the country. Our valedictorian and salutatorian this year are young African American men. One who has a full scholarship to Fisk University and the other a full scholarship to Morehouse College. Well, that's all, um, all 16 are going to college, have been accepted, and we have over $5 million worth of scholarships for them. And that's great. Let's give them a hand. Let's give them a hand. And at some point, I might ask you to, uh, to talk to their parents and bring one or two of them on the set will. with us. Absolutely. Look, Heritage Christian Academy uh, espouses an education that uh, prepares students socially, uh, psychologically, and spiritually for life after high school and college and moving into the real world. And uh, one of the things that they unabashedly talk about at Heritage Christian Academy is, is the basis for a lot of, or most of, or all of their pedagogy is based on the life and times of one Jesus Christ. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Now, oftentimes when folks talk about a curriculum or a process that's based on such strong spirituality, Jesus Christ, a lot of times my experience has been people have a tendency to kind of either tune out because they're thinking they're going to be proselytized or or they get real excited because they're going to get something different and new. Have you, ex have you experienced some of both? We've experienced some of both, but I think once people come to know us, they realize that Jesus Christ was a person who accepted and worked with everybody, yeah. as do we. We believe that Jesus Christ is our follower here on earth. And we also believe that if we follow him, we have to do what he did. And that means we have to work and prepare everybody for the next step of living. No question. So having said that, when you had this idea to start Heritage Christian Academy, uh, what was the backdrop for it? Where were you located? When you woke up that fine morning and said, I'm going to do this, all right, after, uh, after someone tried to talk you out of it, I'm sure. Uh, what was the what, what was the primary emphasis for you moving forward? We were already working with another a number of students at a former school. Okay. And that school closed its doors for a lot of reasons that had nothing to do with with the teachers or children. Okay. So the parents asked the question, "What do we do next?" And we said, "Well, we will pray, and we hope you all find a school." Well, as the summer began. It came to me and to some of our, our students and to some of our teachers that we need another school. Our students, in fact, said, Mrs. Gill, why don't you start a school? And of course, after working in schools for 40 some years, I said, start a school. It's one thing to be in a school district where things are provided. It's another whole thing to start a school. But we took that vision and we began. We started with 35 children. We're now at 75 over a three year period, and we decided to do what we knew was educationally sound. We began working with the Maryland state standards so that our students could be accepted everywhere, and now we're gonna go back to core standards and core values because that's where the state is going. Right, exactly. Now, as you make that transition toward the core values, what, what are some of the specific things you have to do within your institution to move that model in that direction? Well, we have to order some more professional development and training for our younger teachers, but actually the core, the core values are where we came up. The core values are where we started, with students being able to read, to write, to compute, to communicate, to be scientifically sound, and now technology, technologically sound. 
Um, we don't have much changing to do because we keep good data. Okay. And our data isn't only to show where we stand in comparison to other high schools, where we stand in comparison to other middle schools and elementary schools. The data is usually just to show us where we need to teach and what gaps we need to close in children's learning. As the more gaps we close, the better they do. We also know that many times standardized testing is questioned in our state and in our, in our county, particularly in small schools. Right. So what we do is we go to other agencies to actually test us or have our, our children tested with public school children. Okay. And, and what has that experience been like? It's been good. It's been good. Um, we find that Prince George's County has been particularly welcoming. We found that we have established some partnerships even with public schools. And we've also found that some children who need a second or sometimes a third chance end up coming to us. You mentioned that before, before we take our break. Let's talk about that second and third chance. I had a chance to sit in on some of the conversation that you guys were having earlier before the show started. And um, I know that one of the concerns that we have in all of these metropolitan areas is the, for lack of a better way to describe it, low graduation rates for a lot of students who are from these urban areas. When you say second and third chance, tell me what that looks like. For third chance students? Many times students just get stuck. We had a conversation well, earlier. Get stuck yeah, but many times students really get stuck. Okay. And sometimes it's hard to pull them out. For example, that fourth grade year, that fifth grade year when those standards change, if they haven't been real successful in grades K through three in learning to read, it's then hard to read to learn. Yeah, it's, it's, right, it becomes a shock to It becomes system. a shock to their system. And so we make sure that they get plenty of practice learning how to read. And that's not only through textbooks, that's through action. Okay. That's through, through communication. Okay. Also in middle school, sometimes kids get stuck. And it's difficult to, to move them forward. So again, we go back through the learning process of what didn't you learn before. By high school students, we hope when they come with us for three years are usually ready. But sometimes even a high school will come in a difficult situation. Sometimes they move. Sometimes their attitude has been less than. But we make a contract with that student and that parent when they come that says, we promise to do our best to make sure that you are ready for life after high school if you do these things. We don't make a whole laundry list. There are eight things. Right, right. The eight things. What are some of the things on that list? One of the things is that you come to school on time every day. OK, I would have failed out. You come to school on time every day because I, wait, we're here no, on time. I came to school every day. On time was a, I'm sorry. Good. But when you're not on time, you waste the academic learning time. I'm sorry. And so what that means is we as teachers have got to be there on time. Okay. That's true. One thing we tell students, we do have a uniform policy. Wear your uniform. We have three different uniforms. You have a choice. Except on Monday, you come in your, jersey, in your dress uniform. Another thing we do is we ask students to be responsible by keeping yourself and everyone else around you safe. And what do we mean by safe? We mean to protect yourselves when you're walking, when you're riding a bus. We mean you don't use any drugs, any weapons. We mean if we find those things, we've got to take action because our first responsibility to your parents is to keep you safe. Without a doubt. Okay, we're going to take a quick station break. When we get back, uh, Principal Gill, we're going to talk a little bit about education now in this changing sociological environment and what are some of the things you're doing now to deal with it and some of your preparations for things as you see it moving forward. Folks, sit tight. If you would, we'll be back shortly. Rolling Rhymes Live Show Live, not just sports and entertainment. We'll be back with you in a few moments. Thank you. My brother in the back that said, ooh, I do appreciate you, man. You come back next week. And uh, once again, Rolling Public Grimes here at the Rolling Grimes, not just sports entertainment show, Everlasting Life Restaurant.
with my good friend Principal Gill, Heritage uh, Christian Academy. I want to start out by asking you about the standard, the scholastic aptitude test. Now, when I was growing up and when I was involved in education, everyone is talking about the SAT. Either, the, either it's the dreaded SAT or it's the wonderful SAT, but oftentimes it's perceived as something dreadful. Now, I don't know where that kind of comes from, but it is what it is. What's going on with the Scholastic Aptitude Test today? One of the things that's going on that in 2016, the SAT is going to change. Huh? It's going to change, and all of my educator friends know that. It's going to change. That's 24 months. That's 24 months. It's going to change. The change is beginning now. It's beginning now because when we went into the standards movement about 10 years ago, the SAT had added things that students needed to know. We're going back to some old line way of, th of doing things so that students will be particularly responsible for reading and mathematics rather than the writing portion. The challenge gets to be though, we've got to get our children ready for this change because we've got about two years, that means our end of the year ninth graders and 10th graders have got to be ready for the change. The change will affect a lot of things. Number one, it's going to, way, it's going to affect the way data is counted. Number two, it's going to affect athletes because along with the SAT changing in 2016, the NCAA says that every person who goes to the NCAA in order to play college athletics has to have a 2.3 average rather than a 2.0 average. And, and has to have the prerequisites. And has to have the prerequisites. The requisite. Everything. Core classes. Absolutely. So we are changing. And one of the things that, Roland, I love about your shows is that you mentioned that sometimes we tend to be um, just tunnel vision. We look and say the SAT is going to change. That's one thing. The NCAA is going to change. That's another thing. Core content is going to change. That's another thing. So the challenge gets to be who's going to be most ready, how, and why, and in what communities are going to are we going to do in our communities you know, to make sure our children are ready? You know, that's a real good point because, like for example, right now I'm having some issues with the AAU basketball circuit. You know, I love the fact that the youngsters now get to play because they don't have neighborhoods like we did growing up. But they will play during the school year. Let's say basketball runs from typically mid-October, late October, all early November, all the way through March for the most part, especially on the high school level. And then they go into spring AAU. Then they go into summer AAU. And then, excuse me, then they go into fall AAU. But unfortunately, I have not seen one AAU program yet where the students, where they have this big conglomeration of students on a Saturday, and there are no classrooms during that time teaching math skills, English skills, SAT prep. Why, why is it so, I'm, I'm not asking, this is rhetorical, I guess, but I can't understand why it's so complicated if we can get all these students together and we can play basketball all day and all night why we can't have breaks in between the games and we have folks like yourself and people out here in the audience doing SAT prep, doing life coaching, et cetera, so that these students are ahead of the curve when they come back to school in September instead of behind. I read a, uh, the book Malcolm Gladwell, Outliers. Outliers. He talked about how our students actually regressed in the summertime compared to other students in other cultures. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not asking you to necessarily jump all into that right now, but if we're going to, if these things are going to change, it seems to me, and I might be a little illogical, but if everything around me is changing and I stay the same, then I'm going to end up having, I'm going to end up having a problem that I don't need to have. Exactly. Help me out. You're right about AAU ball. I think it goes from September to September. But while but anyway, we're... They do have it for those who aren't involved with but the I school think, program. Right. I think... While they're going now, you've got to realize another change has taken place. The NCAA will only accept a student who is recommended by a high school coach and principal in 2016. They will not accept any more recommendations from any other coaches 
but going through did public it, or private high school. Did any of you know this was coming? Because this is my first time hearing this one. Hmm. So that student must be ready with that 2.3 average. Tomorrow night, while our seniors are on their trip, we're going to launch our class of 2015. The reason we're doing that is because several of those young men will be D1 or D2 players, but they must come forth before their families and the community and present their essays on who am I. Okay. And it has everything to do with life, everything to do with academics, and some things to do with athletics, okay. because they're going to be men far longer than they're going to be well, athletes. I'll be honest with you, if you asked me at 15, who am I, the first thing I'm going to say is, and, and some people know it, I'm going to say I am a basketball player, I am a football player, I am a track spurt, and then, oh, by the way, I'm the son of Wyoming well, and Roland Grimes, and I live in Southeast, but the first things on my list are going to be my athletic pursuits. That may be true, but we make it our business to tell students other qualities that they have. These students are 16 and 17 years want, old. You want them to recognize that within themselves? We want them to rec recognize that now. Okay. As, you, as you talk about coaching, the only kind, of, the only kind of coaching they may have come to us knowing is athletic coaching, right, right. but there's all kind of life coaching. And that's what I think we do really well. We have some students, we have one young man, the young man who's going to Morehouse on a full scholarship, played varsity basketball and probably could have walked in as a D1 or D2 player. He said, my parents are paying for this education. I'm going down here to Morehouse. It's D2. And if I walk in, I walk in. But I've got to keep my grades up. Okay. So there's some shifting now right. in terms of what, what students are talking about now. As we talk about the young men, we have a high quality girls volleyball team and that just started this year. Wow. They're not a championship team, but they're young ladies who found they could do something else. But every young lady on that, that volleyball team is on the honor roll. And three fourths of the young men who play basketball and flag football are on the honor roll. Okay. So we set a standard where they got to meet where they, where the standard has shifted so that now you don't have to feel badly about being smart as well. You can feel good about being smart. Okay, so to create that culture, a couple of quick questions before I open this up for the uh, audience. All right, real quick, I want to ask you, someone wants to contact you at Heritage Christian Academy, what's the best way for them to reach you? We have a website, heritagechristianacademymd.org. Look at our website, call us on 301-577-8874. Quickly, give me a profile, if you would, of the type of students that you're looking forward to coming to your path? We're looking for students who have an idea that they want to go forth well. They don't have to be an A, B, or high C student. They have to have a, willing to, a willingness to work and to get whatever challenges they may bring straight. Okay. So, folks, we're going to take a quick station break and we're going to continue on. Well, Grimes, show live, not just sports entertainment. We'll be back at you in a few moments. Thank you. Really, if you have a 2.3 average, you shouldn't be playing sports. Period. I agree with you wholeheartedly. All of my kids have a higher average than that. I think some of the things, and especially when some of our guests come forth this evening, that needs to go forth as a higher bar. If you remember way back when, there was a big conflict at the University of Maryland because their, their coach set the, set the standard higher. And it went through the Maryland legislature, and it came back then a 2.0. And it's just risen to a 2.3 nationally. But I think you're right. I think we've got to have some discussions about it. And I think we need a lot of people discussing it. We need the sports side. We need the academic side. We need the parents. We need actually business people, everyone, colleges who are looking at what our, what our children can do next. Yes. Just because I don't know the full background. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, awesome. Just because I don't know the full background. When you started your school, like, did you run into any issues like with funding or like 
were just doors open or coming? Well, no. Awesome, when we opened the school, um, I am a retired DC public school principal. I retired in 1999, and I went to the National Center to work for several, seven, seven years. In the National Center, I discovered that there were a lot of things that we didn't know about schooling that some other people knew. So when I came back, I said, where can I work? And so we began working in a Christian school. That closed its doors because the church shifted. It had nothing to do with us. When we started our schools, we were very blessed because we had a basis of some families who wanted to go forward. And so we started from that basis. We went to a church that welcomed us that said, you may have your school here, and that was it. Um, it was done really out of obligation, out of obedience, and out of sacrifice. And you know what the economic times have been. It's very different than starting a charter school where you have to have everything in place, every teacher certified and approved just like they are, and then you begin to get your funding. But what happens with so many charter schools is that there are other bills to pay, the unforeseen costs that aren't put in. And we just had a CFO and Mr. Michael Hunter, a counselor, teachers who were willing to look at that with us and say, what is our overhead really? So it's been God that we've been able to go forth and we're yielding the results for just going forward. Yes, sir. I'm an educator in the collegiate level. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot of athletes come through our institution and some of us professors are got, trying to get our hands out because it's based on, our funding is based on numbers. Right. Mm -hmm. rate. Mm -hmm. So it kind of, um, I guess my question is, is your school or the PG County schools are not on the, the lower levels, but it, I'm not sure if they're based on funding and numbers. Based, um, their funding is based on how many people graduate, their graduation rate, because I know the college level is truly based on that. The colleges are based on that. Um, funding is based on the amount of students, the number of special needs students, and it's shifted a lot in Prince George's County. We are not a public school, we're a private school. We just got our first funding this year from the textbook office so we can get textbooks because we qualify now. In the public school system, each school is given a budget based on what fiscal responsibilities and what each school must meet. So when you have a graduation rate that say is under 40%, that is, is under 50%, there's a challenge. And they make it look like a challenge here in PD, in PG, but what happens is that the graduation rate is like that all over the country. It's not just here. The question gets to be for you is, when you go to college, how many people graduate from your college who come in from the freshman class? That's usually about 30%. So that's why your money is designated differently than the public school money. The public school takes everybody. We take who applies to our school, who's responsible, who comes, and who's accepted. So the public schools really have a tremendous job in what they do in terms of dealing with every, every child and all the children simultaneously. Yes? That's average over the country. If you look at the amount of freshmen who will enter the freshman class of all colleges in September 2014, the estimated result is that uh, about 30% will graduate in 2018 or 19. Nationally. Can, can you break? Have, have there been any studies to look at specific cohorts of, of that population, like say Ivy League versus state colleges? Um, I think there are. Co I'm not so. For, I'm not so familiar with the cohorts in terms of the types of colleges. The cohorts now are broken down in terms of types of grouping, like African American, like Asian, like Latino. And then, of course, your levels may be higher at your Yales and Harvards and Columbias. And then you come down to mid-level schools. The challenge gets to be also, though, when you finish with a bachelor's degree, that's not nearly as important as what happens with what you do, the type of job you get in your master's degree. And that's just, that's data-driven. have a number, but that number really doesn't mean anything. Oh, I think it means everything to us. I mean, 30%, you 
that graduated across the board, how do you improve that number? How do you get it to 80%? Well, I think that everybody has got to begin to know how they approve it within their individual schools, number one. Number two, to take a whole mass, you've got to look at each school individually. 100% of our students are going to college. I'm going to tell you that 100% of them are going to graduate. So we can only do that based on what we do, school by school by school. Yeah, so that number, that, that, that general number really is kind of meaningless because you really have to look at it school by school or region by region or Ivy League school versus some other school to really have a number that you can compare to and that you can, um, you can um, make decisions on and develop theories and test hypotheses. Well, you can, test, you can test hypothesis right here in Prince George's County. You can test hypothesis with Ivy League schools, but Ivy League schools have a lot of foundation money in place to make sure that nobody falls between the cracks. Okay, Your other schools don't necessarily have that same money in place, and you have to look at each school what your money is based upon. Then the question is, what do we have to do as a community to, money. to develop that type of investment? What we have to do is do what we're doing now, and first of all, get the information out there and ask the questions. We're going to get into some of that. Get we're money. Move forward. Get money. Get real money. Quick. I'm going to, I'm going to let her take a break. But any other questions out there before, before we take a break? We're going to do, hold up, my oh, man, sit tight. All right, we're going to get into it, all right? Yeah, we did. That was a plan. That was a plan. That was a plan. That was a plan. All right, well, now you can stay. <laughs> all right. All right, folks, let's give Principal Hill a hand. Mr. Henry. 